In this last section, we're going to be talking about the different groupings of microorganisms. And so we can group microbes into one of three domains. Domains are the largest classification that we have. We have three domains. Two of those domains are called prokaryotic domains. Those are bacteria and archaea. And then we have one eukaryotic domain called eukarya. The organisms in each domain are going to share specific characteristics. So in both bacteria and archaea, which are both prokaryotic, all of those organisms are called prokaryotes. They're in two different domains, so they differ, but they're all prokaryotes. And prokaryotes lack a nucleus, and they don't have very many organelles. Whereas organisms in the domain eukarya, they are eukaryotic. They have a membrane-bound nucleus. Prokaryotes are typically considered more simple in structure. They are always single-celled. They typically contain one single strand, circular strand, of DNA. They have no nucleus, so the DNA sits in a region called the nucleoid. They don't have organelles in general. And examples of prokaryotic organisms, one that we have talked about before, cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, which are the same. So um, the this name blue-green algae is cyanobacteria. Eukaryotes, then, the term eukaryote means true nucleus. They have a nucleus. They have a membrane-bound organelle. They are larger. They are more complex. They have more DNA found within the nucleus. And most of the organisms that we know are eukaryotes. That doesn't mean that there are more eukaryotes than prokaryotes. Bacteria outnumber eukaryotes a lot, but the different organisms, the different species, we know more eukaryotes than we do bacteria or um, archaea. So let's look at each domain. Bacteria, they are single-celled, they have no nucleus, they have no organelles, their DNA sits in a region called the nucleoid. They have specific shapes, and so I'm going to go to the next slide to show you those shapes. Um, shapes, they can be rod-shaped. These are typical shapes. They can be found in clusters of coccus shapes. They can be found in um, chains of coccus. They can be found in chains of rods. They can be found as spirochetes or spiral shaped. They reproduce via binary fission. They do not reproduce sexually at all. And most of them that are motile, so if they are motile, they use flagella, and they can have a single flagellum, or they can have multiple flagella throughout their body, around their body. Archaea, very similar to bacteria, but they do not have peptidoglycan in their cell wall. They have a different protein um, structure called pseudomurine or pseudopeptidoglycan. Um, their shape is very similar, but they can be extremely unique in shape as well. So the majority are just rod or spherical or spiral shaped like the bacteria, but they can have some very unique shapes as well. Archaea tend to be more extremists, so they're often called the extremophiles. These are the organisms that can live in places like volcanoes, in hydrothermal vents. They live in the Dead Sea, so they're extreme bacteria, or they're basically extreme 
archaeobacteria. And an example of an archaean is a methanogen. Then we have our eukaryotes. So you are a eukaryote. I am a eukaryote. All animals are eukaryotes. Eukaryotes all have a nucleus. We all have organelles. We typically, no, not typically, we are more complex than prokaryotic organisms. We can be single-celled or multicellular. There are four groups of eukaryotes, so protists, fungi, plant, or animal. Um, we fall under animal, and we actually do study some animals in microbiology, but not always because they are microscopic. Um, we study insects because they are vectors, and we study worms because they are microscopic um, in the egg form. So during the, I guess, in their larval or their egg form. Algae are often um, grouped in either plant or in protista, depending. Um, algae have at some points been, you know, put in their own group, but right now they've been um, put in either with the protista or that plant, depending on the type of algae. We will talk about them separately, though. They're a very unique group, though. Um, This is just a figure that shows each of the groups and the uh, representative organisms that you can find. We will not study any plants. We will study the fungi. We will study the protists, uh, including algae, and we'll study a little bit of the animalia groups. So protozoans are always single-celled. Eukaryotic organisms, they do reproduce via both sexual or asexual means. They can be motile, but not all are motile. Some have no ability to move, and if they're in the group, so the group that can't move are called the apicocomplexans, they are all pathogens. Most protozoans are very beneficial to the environment, but there are some that are considered parasitic or pathogenic. Algae, this is a group of microbes that can be multicellular or single-celled. They are all photosynthetic, so they produce oxygen and they get rid of carbon dioxide. They produce their own food and so they are some of the organisms that we tend to use as the primary part of the food chain. Some algae have flagella to allow them to move through the water, but the flagella work differently than prokaryotic flagella. Algae have cellulose as part of their cell wall, so they differ, even the unicellular algae differ from the prokaryotic organisms. Fungi can be single-celled. If they're single-celled, they're called yeasts. If they're multicellular, they're called molds. An example of a mold is a mushroom. So you've probably eaten these types of organisms before. They are heterotrophic, which means they take in organic materials. They're actually chemoheterotrophs, just like we are, but they eat via absorbing the nutrients. Fungi live in moist environments, but they are terrestrial, so they don't live in water. They live on land, but the land has to be very moist for them to grow. The last thing we're going to talk about, then, is how we classify organisms. The basic classification system, you start with the largest classification, so all organisms will fall under one of three domains. From there, we move into the kingdoms, the phylum, the class, the order, the family, the genus, the species. I learned this by um, using a mnemonic, so starting with D, 
Did King Philip come over for good spaghetti? That's how I memorized it. Uh, I expect that you'll be able to memorize it if you don't already know this. Domain is the most inclusive. That means that most organisms will fall under the same domain. So if you are in some specific species, uh, you're going to be very, there's going to be very few organisms here. Only one type, like humans, will be in this group. But under Homo, there could be more than one type of uh, human. So Homo sapien and Homo erectus. That would be an example. So domain is the most inclusive. It, it, it includes all organisms that have similar characteristics, like eukaryotes. Then we go into the kingdom, kingdom animalia. All animals fall under that kingdom. So dogs, worms, humans will fall in the same. Then phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. We use a system called binomial nomenclature to actually determine the name of an organism and to give the name of an organism. So we use both the genus and the specific epithet to give the name of the organism. The genus is always going to be capitalized. The species is always going to be lowercase. They, both words will be either italicized or underlined. So Homo sapien, which is the human, is going to be written with a capital H and then a lowercase s and italicized or underlined. Um, Escherichia coli, bacteria, it's always written like this. And then we can abbreviate using E dot coli. The last few organisms we'll talk about, I say organisms, I should have said microbes, are non-living. So they're non-living because they don't fit the same characteristics that all living things do. They do not have a cell. So all living things are composed of cells, Viruses, viroids, and prions are not cellular, so they are non-living. We typically use the term microbe to include all um, living and non-living agents. Viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They cannot replicate without a cell machinery. Viroids are the same thing. The difference between these two is viroids are smaller Viroids tend to infect plants only, and they only consist of RNA, while, while viruses consist of RNA or DNA. And then prions are very different. They are infectious proteins that cause problems with other proteins. So viruses have nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, packed in a protein coat. They can infect living cells, and they multiply using the living cells machinery. There is not a cell on Earth that doesn't have some virus that can infect it. Even bacteria have viruses. Viroids are much simpler than viruses. They only have RNA. They tend to only cause problems with plants. Um, we haven't found yet that any cause problems with humans, but they can cause some plant diseases. The last are the prions. Prions are proteins that are folded abnormally, and these abnormally folded proteins can cause problems with other proteins causing those proteins to fold abnormally as well. An example of a prion disease, mad cow disease. That's probably the most famous of all of those diseases. So it can cause neurodegenerative diseases in humans as well as other animals. And prions are very hard to destroy. So typical sterilization procedures don't get rid of prions. That's it for chapter one, so I'm going to post this, and I will see you later. Bye.